that leads me on, I think, nicely, building on uh, our introduction where I asked, you know, who is Jerry <laughs> Kobina Amakwando? Mm -hmm. So what is your own personal lifelong journey so far that has brought you as Jerry to the global majority <laughs> versus the UK government case and campaign? Yeah, um, <laughs> keep saying I like your day. <laughs> um, so I can't say my name or answer that question without thinking about ancestry, which for us is, is, is essential to our sense of, of tradition and identity. So I can talk about who has brought me here to, to this place um, without doing all of that for the camera. But for me, it's that story. Well, I can skip a bit, but that story starts um, in 1957 um, when my dad was born. That was also the year that Ghana um, won independence. Um, an important sense of independence, but not, of course, full independence. Um, my mum was born in 1962. Um, and they grew up to witness uh, the coups that oversaw and, and the counter-revolutionary um, insurgency that overthrew real liberation efforts in Ghana, but also throughout West Africa. Um, and they, like many, moved to the UK um, under the guise of opportunities for the next generation. Um, and it's only in, I start there because it's only reclaiming that sense of dispossession. Um, my dad was born in a rich gold mining town, um, absolutely destroyed and ravaged by, by Western forces, um, Western corporations. But it's only in collecting that history that I can wonder how I got here and where the miseducation stopped to say, you know, we have a role to play in order to address the history of violence that we are experiencing that runs through our bodies. Um, and if that was your question, what was your question? Who I am? Um, well, it, it's really asking about how have you come mm -hmm. to be taking this stance now mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in um, terms of your lifelong uh, learning journey? What um, has brought you to this point? Absolutely. I think... I think I had that, a real sense of rediscovery of what that history meant in the past few years, um, especially in the spaces, navigating spaces, um, being at uni, um, trying to work out what it meant to navigate these spaces as a young African, um, knowing even that being a new realisation of me thinking I could just go and live like everybody else um, and something was never really clicking, what it meant to just, you know, go and live and and know what the real harsh realities of, of life are for most people around the world, for the global majority, and think that we, you know, we can continue. And I think there was a way in which I saw that all of these, I mean, you have that realization when you, when you clock the way things are connected mm -hmm. um, and you see the continued ironies and, and the, the location of power that hasn't been displaced for centuries. And you wonder, how is that? And what role do I, when I play when you know that reality? Um, and so I think there was, there's loads of things I could point to. Um, I think, it, but it's really, I think it kind of, it centers around my family and my grounding and the sense of which I knew. We know, we know things aren't right. We feel it in our bodies. Um, and it's totally manifest in, in our environment and the way in which we're seeing, you know, potentially, I mean, it's not even potentially, we are talking about now just surviving the 21st century. Mm -hmm. And we've got to that point that um, there's a stopping point and young people have been leading that charge. And it's, and it's not a lot actually to stand by and to look and say, people who live and know that to lose their life is something for the gain of liberation um, should offer us all the inspiration we need. If we have the true humility or a real sense of love in our hearts, which is enough to say that we stand in solidarity or we care about the world of the world's peoples. Um, and so I kind of got bored of talking. Um, and I met some inspirational people along the way that were able to advance that sense in which, you know, we have a long tradition of resistance of people who've, who stood up and said that way and, and have given us many inroads to be able to advance that struggle. And that is actually, that gave me a sense of understanding what my parents had done in bringing me here and why I was meant to be here um, and why they knew um, that 
they had a path and they had a, a destiny for their children and that's why they think they supported us so much in 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 learning and being curious about the world and <laughs> and now I'm here and I don't really know what I'm doing but the best thing about it I think is that I'm not doing anything um, and it's the support of our community and that's our community's voice who actually have long given us all the words to be able to articulate what we need, to articulate liberation, to be able to talk about the fact that there is no Green New Deal without reparations, there is no just transition unless we're talking about the global south, there is no history or sense of global justice if we haven't started to identify the history of violence and stopped it in the first place. Mm -hmm. And so it's actually a very easy job when you know your community is there and all they need to be is heard. And all we need to do is organise and to take very seriously the threat and violence that we're up against because we know it's there. Mm -hmm. We know, I mean, I was talking to just earlier some, some young people and we were talking about the, the, the environmental crisis and we were talking about how much money can go into, why is it um, that billions can go into um, nuclear warheads mm -hmm. now, today, in, violence of, in violation of international law? Why can the UK do that? And I said, so I said the number, I think it was something like 16 and a half billion had recently been set aside. And a young sister who was nine said, uh, because it's probably going to make more money. <laughs> mm. <laughs> this stuff is yeah. written, it's it's written exactly into our understanding of a world which yeah. is greedy, a world which, which knows that, that has long dehumanised people. It's set people aside to, to continue to be dehumanised. And it allows that invisibilization of real humanity to advance an agenda that is killing us all. Mm. And so the long history that we talk about, we often insist on the last 400 years, but you know, much centuries, I mean, we're talking towards millennia of what it is to oppress and to organize on the basis of hierarchy and, mm. and a disrespect for our local environment, a complete disconnect to our, mm. to our environment. Um, that has led us up to a point where we're now talking about total destruction. Are these not threatening words? Like, are we not, are we not actually going to take seriously what it means to organise against that? And are we not going to, wherever we are, understand that wherever you are, you can, you can stand and offer that support. And all you are doing, all you are doing is giving a platform for the people, for the real leaders who aren't here, who are looking in the wrong place, who have long been there. And I think that's what gives us the strength as well to just keep it moving and, and to not really ask questions like what has really brought us here because we... Somewhere inside us, we know, we know what's brought us here. Um, and, and that's why it's important for us to also know. Because mm -hmm. in listening to you, I think those connections can be made. Because really what you're pointing to is, is, is people being able to assess their situation, the reality of the world that we're living in. Mm -hmm and know what's working, what's not working, and what we need to do, or hopefully be encouraged mm -hmm. to be part of that change. Okay, so moving on, why, from your own viewpoint, and as, for example, in the perspective of key participating formations, like the Stop but, the Manga uh, Measy campaign Manga that I'm part of, mm -hmm. Is the global majority versus the UK government case and campaign being seen and presented as a matter of the interconnections mm -hmm. of reparatory justice, environmental justice, and cognitive justice? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's because when we start from a place of, when we, st we start from a, st a standpoint of, of the need for reparations, I will come back to that. But when we talk about something like the environmental, um, the environmental crisis and environmental injustice, the climate of injustice, um, and we look back as African peoples in our own sense, in our own heritage, in our own history, in our traditions of resistance, um, then you go back to a time like 1884 and the Berlin Conference. And the great pan-European powers, so-called, came together and divided up and made a pie of what we call Mama Africa. And, they, and, and in doing that, I think, you see this way in which power sets a trajectory for the lived experience of many people. But in that same, around that same time, you know, you take Yara Santiwa, 
we had the force of resistance that alongside that always stood up for their right to self-determination, their right to autonomy as African peoples. Mm -hmm. And that resistance, again, is it's part of that tradition that we run through. But you fast forward 140 years and we're here now. And the great pan-European, pan-Euro-American powers are meeting again. They're at it again. <laughs> they didn't ever stop, did they? <laughs> they don't stop meeting up. But they... <laughs> and it's November. And they're coming now in November, they're going to meet again for another conference. Um, and it's not the Berlin conference this time. It's the, it's the where is it, Glasgow? Where are they meeting? Scotland. Um, the Scotland conference, let's call it. Cop. Cop for COP26. COP26, that's right. And in this time, we're gonna, what we've already seen and what they've been gearing up to do is all this posturing about, here's how we solve the world's problems. I mean, we saw if the worst was at Davos and the World Economic Forum. But they're at it again in the sense of this long trajectory of a history which is tired. It didn't stop. Mm -hmm. And so the environmental harm, the sense of environmental injustice, isn't being challenged by the great powers that be, but only by the forces of people power embodied, embodied in, in our elders, like ancestor Yara Santiwa, embodied in the history of our communities of, of resistance who have, who have you know, worked to create the languages of reparative justice, like Dr. Um, who who actually empowered and enabled us and on whose shoulders we actually stand to be able to take that torch and advance the next cause of how we introduce this language of justice and repair and history of stopping the harm, introduce it into the real mechanisms of, of power as they operate right now in us, in our society. Um, and so that history of, of colonial violence, mm -hmm. the history and that present experience, that, that history and present of colonial violence to which we stand in resistance, to which we are opposed, to which the obvious answer and the only solution is reparatory justice and reparations, I mean, to stop the harm, to, to, to guarantee non-repetition, to satisfy us as people who have experienced that harm, that mm -hmm. we can move forward, mm -hmm. um, to, re to return things to as close as possible to the Africa that we know, the ancestral history and wisdom that we know we feel through us. That is, the, that, I mean, that is what it is to now challenge that history which continues to manifest itself today. And so any time that we insist on stopping the harm, stopping the violence, all things which seem apparent and, and you know, float around um, ideas of human rights, mm -hmm. um, international, the foundation of international law being um, the no harm principle. You know, this language exists there, but in the, in, the, in the languages of when Boris Johnson says that, when Boris Johnson says Black Lives Matter, I don't even know, we don't even know what it means. But when we as people can step up to say that, you know, this history and this, and this, the necessity of stopping the harm is a legal reality, it's a human rights reality. That is, I think, how we move past this sense of environmental justice being this ambiguous mm. thing of um, like timelines and, and numbers, but the real value of African lives, the real value of, of the, the rights of the global majority. And for us, that obviously that necessitates. Uh, what was the last term on that paper? Cognitive justice. That, that's what cognitive justice has got to be, because it has to frame. It has to require a switch in our mentality away from um, a complicity that acknowledges that, that human rights say are a thing. Mm. Um, that we are a society that that deals with and acknowledges human rights. Mm -hmm. While our, our own family members are living experience that tells us completely otherwise. And until we can make the switch, the decolonial switch, a switch that is not centred in the hypocrisy or the lies of Imperial Britain, and we can embody that as per the real realities and the voices of our people, mm. I think that's the cognitive justice aspects that is required, I mean, across society, if we're going to be sincere about surviving the 21st century, if we're going to be sincere about fighting for our lives. Um, and we are being sincere, people are being sincere about fighting for their lives. And it's just those people who have, who, the cognitive justice switch isn't even, I mean, these aren't things that, mm -hmm. these aren't remote realities. Sure. These are the realities of survival. And is there not something about, in terms of the cognitive justice angle, uh, the way that you're framing the case 
your advocacy in terms of the campaign, mm -hmm. um, the fact that you're connecting to communities back home mm -hmm. in terms of communities of resistance in uh, Africa, Abiyala and other parts of the global south. Isn't there something in there around also restoring the knowledge systems, the wisdom, mm -hmm. the truths, mm -hmm. the science that, that our people have always known, mm -hmm. that have been delegitimized in, say, the global north? Mm -hmm. Doesn't this case also offer opportunities for just reframing so much of what we've come to accept mm -hmm. as progress, <laughs> development, yeah. advancement, enlightenment, enlightenment absolutely. growth, absolutely. I think civilization absolute, even. Absolutely. The logics of our society have been, have been, I mean, if there are any challenges or any weak defences that people come up and saying, you know, but, <laughs> you know that sort of violent rhetoric of we did this, we offered this. We are, we're staring down, again, total genocide and ecocide and, and doubling down on that on those words for me is so important mm. because the second we step away from the real reality and we connect to this dualistic sense of you know thought being removed from the real actions and lived bodily experiences which is totally antithetical to African thinking to African spirituality mm. that's the cognitive justice switch which for us is to say you know we've exposed all of these things all of these have been exposed as lies because otherwise we would be threatened within, within the skin of our team. I mean, we wouldn't be, that wouldn't be the lived experience. But to re what it is, is to, to restore that is for us, I think, to... It's been such a learning ex experience. Mm. One, to share the space with, with so many different formations and to challenge what is the truth of our miseducation as young people. To have grown up in a society that has made us insist on a sense of an identity that is totally removed from where our real power base is, mm -hmm. from where, from where the, the, res the resources and the wealth and the community and the identity of who we are, of where my parents migrated from. We live opposed to that existence on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And it's not even just re restoring it because they're there, but it's, it's defending them and therefore supporting people's rights to self-determination. African rights of the self-determination, which are a, different, a very different thing from insisting on rights and gains here in order to live further at the expense and destruction of the, our own knowledge systems. And so it's protecting that and restoring it and understanding that many of our solutions that we face are written in the land and experience of Africa. When, when we can stand up for that and when we are organising for a united continent, for a continent. And these are, I think it's really important for me that I understand, I understand my sense of political identity and that Pan-Africanism as a, mm. it's a political project. We're not doing this just because, it's not just because it's, it's a fun, pretty idea. No, it's about survival. And that is what our, our honourable um, aunties and uncles of, 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 and our ancestors understand, that it's, we are very staring at a reality in which we are divided to the point of destruction, of total mm -hmm. genocide, of the Maung and this is the, the full culmination of the Maungamizi, of chattel enslavement, of colonialism, neocolonialism, is total genocide. It's five degrees, six degrees of warming, warming at the end of this century, married with the wars, um, the wars to the, to the pillage and loot out the rest of our resources in order to fuel the experience of a tiny, tiny, tiny minority. Mm -hmm. And so the real roots of resistance and power, I mean, we know where they lie. And so for us, restoring that, but also learning about it and embodying it is the only solution. Thank you. Very, very comprehensively <laughs> answered.